On this week's Wealth Tracker, you prepared for the great rotation. In an exclusive interview, the chief investment strategist of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, describes how the financial ground is shifting under our feet. Michael Hartnett is next on Consuelo Mack Wealth Track. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Fairholm Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Can you feel the investment ground shifting under your feet? Is your portfolio off balance, even out of whack? Well, if so, welcome to the great rotation. That is how this week's exclusive Wealth Track guest describes the financial sea changes we are experiencing that go far beyond Dow 20,000 and the presidency of Donald Trump. He is Michael Hartnett, a financial thought leader and chief investment strategist at Bank of America Merrill Lynch Global Research, where he identifies key global market trends and provides strategic insights and solutions for both institutional and individual clients. His research team was named the top global research firm of 2016 by Institutional Investor Magazine for the sixth straight year. Hartnett and his group are big on themes, which put economic, investment, demographic, and even cultural and social trends around the world in perspective. And just about everywhere they look, there is a great rotation occurring. The global economy is moving from secular stagnation to cyclical recovery. Deflation is disappearing and inflation is appearing. Central bank stimulus is being replaced by fiscal stimulus. Globalization is being pressured by isolationism, and the winning investments of the last eight years are being eclipsed. Bonds are falling, commodities are rallying, growth stocks are now lagging value ones, large cap has been overtaken by small cap, and technology has ceded its leadership to banks. Why are these shifts occurring? How durable are they, and what do they mean for our investments? I started our conversation by asking Hartnett about what he describes as a new era from Davos man to Joe Sixpack. In the past 10 years, you've been in a, an economic environment where there hasn't been a lot of growth, there hasn't been a lot of in, uh, inflation and interest rates have come down and down and down. And that's been incredibly positive for certain asset classes. It's been great for the 1%, it's been great for capitalists, it's been great for bonds, it's been great for you know, what the rich people, you know, buy right. and own, like sort of financial high quality. Assets. Inter- yeah, right. financial assets. They've done incredibly well. Whereas a lot of other stuff that, you know, is associated with Main Street, maybe, you know, commodities, it may be value stocks, of course, the banks, you know, been left behind in their wake. So if suddenly you've got, you know, this, this political revolution that's telling you that all these populist policies are coming along and these populist policies suddenly are going to make growth and inflation and interest rates go in a different direction, mm-hmm. you're going to have a different portfolio. And and so the flip that we're talking about is all these assets, which we dub Davos man assets are going to underperform now relative to what we call the Joe six pack right. assets, which are things like commodities, certain equities, value stocks, banks, it could be stuff small in the rest stocks. of the world, certainly right. small cap, which have already done very well. So that that's, that's the idea. So this great rotation that I described in my introduction to you, which comes from a Bank of America Merrill Lynch yeah. report, why is it all happening now? I mean, what's what's driving this in so many areas you're seeing this rotation? Well, I think, you know, the easy answer is Trump. You know, the, the, the second answer is Brexit. You know, the, the third answer is that, that suddenly you have electorates that are saying, you know, we're fed up with secular stagnation. We're fed up you know, we're not seeing wages go Mm -hmm. up. We want to vote for people that we hope will make our wages go up. Mm -hmm. You you know, we'll create jobs and, you know, a bigger share of the spoils, if you like. So, you know, we'll see if that's happened. But the real inflection point last year was also interest rates, is is that suddenly you saw interest rates perhaps inflect for the first time in 30, 35 years. And, And that's really 
really big for the financial markets. Because if interest rates are now going up rather than down, then that brings into play all these assets that you know, were previously uninvestable or you know, no one really wanted mm-hmm. to, to own. The commodities, you know, certain parts of the equity market, as I said, the small cap, the banks, the value, the non-US equities and all this sort of stuff, because they will benefit from inflation. Right. Central banks around the world, their fervent desire has been to move from a deflationary environment yeah. to an inflationary one. So eight years uh, you know, from the bottom in 2009, yeah. they are finally getting their wish. Yes. Uh, and poor why? things, none of them are around to sort of congratulate <laughs> themselves because no one's talking about you know, the central bank. Yes. But, and but, one of the but, great but, irony is that the year in which they could actually say, you know, mission accomplished, you know, is, is, is the year that they're get, getting pushed aside the side of the stage, so, so to speak. So this, this secular stagnation that, that we've had yeah. now for the last decade, why is, has it suddenly turned into this cyclical recovery? I mean, it, it, is, it, is it because of what the, the central banks did or finally kicking in? Well, I mean, the, or what is it? But, but, why well, is remember, this happening? It hasn't yet necessarily. Okay. I mean, it, it, you know, this is an expectations game. And I think that, I see. that one of the things clearly that's happened is that all the things that people were really, really worried about last year, China blowing up, the energy market blowing up, high yield blowing up, you know, that, that, that fear has vanished. Mm-hmm. Then along comes these elections and suddenly everyone's talking sort of fiscal stimulus. Yes, fiscal stimulus, right. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why the central banks have sort of been pushed to the side of the, you know, the stage. Um, but it also is that, you know, one of the great healers of, you know, any recession is time, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and this recovery has been going on for, you know, quite some time. Eight years. I mean, we're um, getting into record long yeah, recovery and it's, and territory. It's, very, it's very, been a very slow one and a sluggish one and not a particularly exciting one. Right. But you, you finally got both in the US and perhaps also Japan to full employment. And, and that means that wages begin to, you know, pick up. So it may just be time as well as the introduction of populist fiscal, fiscal measures, as, w- as well as sort of all these tail risks sort of vanishing. You mentioned that it, it is a s- cyclical mm. recovery that you expect. So you don't see it happening yet? That this is not yet real? It, we're well, not, I think the last couple of months happening? you've begun to see economic data that, that tells you that, firstly, even before Brexit, there was momentum gathering yes. in the global economy. And again, that was really everyone a year ago was positioned for a bankruptcy, something to do with China, something to do with energy, something, it didn't happen. So thereafter, you had an easing of policy, the ECB, the Chinese, even the Fed really sort of eased in terms of their dollar policy. And you saw the economy begin to pick up, the momentum, you know, continued. Really what's happened the last couple of months is because you've had a lot of politicians being voted in saying, we're going to do cut taxes, deregulation, we're going to come through with infrastructure spending animal spirits have got juiced up. And what right. you've seen is a lot of survey data that's telling you that the economy is now moving from second gear up to third, maybe, maybe even fourth gear. So the timing of it has been you know, beautiful, really. You talked about we've come from a period of secular stagnation and secular connotes mm. longer term structural to a cyclical recovery, yeah. which again, cyclical sounds like a quick rebound. It might not last. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, when are we going to see these animal spirits actually translate into to hard evidence? Well, I think there's already evidence in wages. If you look at average mm-hmm. hourly earnings in the U.S., they're close the to US. 3% now, whereas they've been roughly 2%, you know, for much of the past, you know, five to 10 years. You know, Japan, you're also beginning to see a pickup in wages. But, you know, living as I did in Japan in the 1990s, you know, what you saw was a deflation that they just couldn't get rid of. Right. And, and really that was because you never got the housing market picking up, the bank lending market picking up, and the small business sector, you know, picking up. And I think that's really the last couple of months what I think people have been very impressed with. Small business confidence has jumped very sharply in the US. In the US. Mm-hmm. It looks as though bank lending is beginning to push higher. And certainly what the bank stocks have done recently would suggest that they're going to be in more mood to lend money going forward. Right. And then thirdly, the housing market also, in a much more uncertain way, looks as though it's picking up despite this move higher in interest rates. So, you know, if you get that holy trinity of real estate, small businesses, 
bank lending clicking in, then the deflation story really is over and you've got a good one or two years of cyclical inflation picking up, I think. So the, the U.S. has been the global leader in recovery. So after yeah. years of stagnation, what you just described, we definitely are starting to see a pickup yeah. in activity. Uh, but at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, you're saying that this is not where the action is going to be investment-wise. And Right. And that, in fact, yeah, I mean, certain U.S. investments will work. Small uh -huh. caps work. The banks have worked. And of course, the U.S. dollar, because, as you say, the U.S. dollar is the leader of this story, you know, should also work. Yes. But where you've got more distressed you know, value is clearly overseas. So the U.S. is no longer priced for deflation. Europe is. Japan is. China is. So you've got more upside there if the story truly is inflation, mm -hmm. you know, particularly in areas like the financials over there. Are you seeing uh, inflation picking up in Japan? Yes, a little bit on the wage side. You definitely are in China because if mm -hmm. you remember recently, the Chinese actually raised interest rates because their producer price inflation is running at about 5% and consumer price mm -hmm. inflation has picked up to about 3%. So inflation certainly has picked up in China. Europe you know, it's a little bit more fragile, the environment there. But even so, you know, inflation has stopped going down and has turned positive again. Is this the, the time to invest in Japan? Well, I think that um, there's no doubt that both the individual investor and the institutional investor are, are giving Japan a very hard look right now. And, and we've certainly seen inflows into the equity market. You know, a lot of it is driven by the idea that the dollar's going up and the yen is going down. If the yen goes down, the export companies, right. you know, pick up. So people are still looking at Japan in a slightly old fashioned way that it's just a yen trade effectively. If this really is the story of, of you know, the end of Japanese deflation, of course, Japanese deflation has been going on for 20, 25 right. years. There is big upside for the Japanese equity market. And the equity market upside is going to be driven by areas like small cap and the financial stocks within Japan. So you want to play domestic Japan, not overseas Japan, Japan if you like. Europe and so, in, so in, in local currency, you're, you're, you wouldn't do the translation, you wouldn't do hedged, uh, yeah, dollar I mean, I think, hedged, I think right? Initially, you would be hedged because a week yet, right. the yen still has to go down and the dollar still has to go up a bit. But I think as we approached 125, certainly 130 yen, you, you don't need to hedge because I think that, that ultimately, again, what is the end of Japanese deflation? It's when the equity market goes up without requiring the currency to go down, you know, because they're generating enough sort of mm -hmm. good stuff internally that they don't need the currency to go down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But I do think Japan generally as a, a, an investment is, I would argue, is more crowded today than Europe and certainly China. I mean, they, they are, I mean, China, really is the one that, you know, if you were looking out a year or two, offers the biggest upside. Again, if you truly believe that we're shifting from a deflationary to an inflationary environment. And, and how does one invest in China as, a, as an individual investor? It, what, what, what are the China plays? Are they commodities uh, again, as they have been in the past? Or Yes, I mean, I think yeah. that the, there are material companies, you know, to a certain extent, the energy complex, because, you know, China is still a, you know, a big consumer of, yes. of, of those things. You know, there is the Chinese stock market itself. Now, obviously, you know, there are restrictions as to what foreigners can buy right. locally in China. But of course, there are now, you know, structured products that you can use that, that you know, deliver you know, equivalent upside or downside in terms of Chinese assets. So I think there are ways to play it. The other way that people like playing it and probably is the consensus way of playing it right now is that just like the yen has gone down, just like the euro has gone down, there are a lot of bets being placed that the renminbi is going to go down. And certainly, you know, that is one of the more consensus positions out there today. So take us to Europe. Yeah. Michael, what is the story well, with you, you, the Eurozone you, and, and the opportunities that you see there, investment opportunities? Well, the investment opportunity is driven by the fact that people aren't there. They're not there mm -hmm. primarily because of you know, what's been happening in Europe the past you know, five years, which you know, is not a lot of good news. But also you've got in 2017 a pretty heavy political you know, schedule. You know, clearly the new US administration and the German administration have not exactly got off to a, exactly. you know, a, 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 good, a good start. You know, start. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are issues there that, that people are worried about. But the big issue is still 
you know, the banking system in, in, in Europe. And, and what I would argue... Has it been reformed? Has it been restructured? I mean, we certainly did no, a good job I here in the US. I don't think as... Um, thoroughly or... Thoroughly, aggressively, right. completely as, you know, was the case in the US. Um, but yet, you know, there is this sort of interesting, you know, statistic. You've looked back, you know, in the past five years, what is the best US equity sector. I mean, it's actually the financials. It's the financials, which is stunning. Stunning, right. if you think about the regulation, the fines, and the general sort of climate. And, and, and the volatility in the last five years in the yeah. sector. And I think it, it's incredible. happened It happened because the housing market got better. And it happened because people were allowed, therefore, to think that the economy was going to get better. And, and in Europe right now, you have very distressed you know, valuations mm -hmm. in the financial stocks. I mean, right now, Google and Amazon together you know, their market cap exceeds the market cap of every single European and Japanese financial institution put together. I mean, it just That's blows your mind if you think about it. Yes. So the value is there. What there isn't there yet is a belief that the economy is going to get better. If the economy is going to get better and suddenly all these negative interest rates in Europe turn positive, the banks have the biggest upside to that. And that's starting to happen, right? I think the, so. The, so the, the, the trillions of dollars in, in negative uh, interest rate sovereign debt is still trillions, but it's... Yeah. it's it was 30, it's, it was 13, 13 trillion and now what it, it's July, now. it's now six or seven. Oh, huge. I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's a big a change. Big, big change yeah. Right. So part of your professional portfolio yeah. is that you also are on the committee that oversees asset allocation yeah. with the Bank of America Merrill Lynch retail clients. Yeah. So, so tell us about the asset allocation. I'm going to ask you specifically, sure. certainly if your clients are like and any other investors, they've been very much looking for yield over mm, the last yeah. eight years. And so they've been in investment grade bonds and high yield bonds. They've been in dividend paying stocks. Correct, they've been in REITs. Yeah. What are you telling your clients to do with, with those assets in their portfolio? Well, reduce them. Reduce them. Um, I mean, if there was a, you know, a slogan, mm -hmm. really it would be down in quality in equities and up in quality in fixed income or bonds mm -hmm. in, the, in that you want to be in the less high quality, high growth equities because the economy is picking up and that's when you want to be in value and uh, you know companies that have a little bit more debt and so on and so forth they work when inflation's becoming a little bit right. more ample but in fixed income you know you've got a problem you know it's the end of a 35 year bull market you know everyone's up to their gills mm -hmm. in in high yes. yielding products and the ability for inflation and interest rates to surprise on the upside is is quite high as we've seen in the past you know 6 months and you know clearly you know, if you've been long bonds for, you know, 10, 20 years, I mean, it's very difficult to give up that. It is. You know, and I mean, they've it, done it, extremely and, and, well. Yeah. As so, fact, so, so, you know, you understand that it takes a little bit of time, but, but I still think it's the right to do. You want to go up in quality, you know, in fixed income. You want right. to get, you know, have a little bit less in, you know, some of the higher beta junkier areas mm -hmm. of fixed income, which I think people have now, the investment grade, the high yield. I think you want to be more in the, you know, the safer, you know, investments in, in fixed income. And how radical uh, a change are you advocating that we make? Because again, I go back to our earlier yeah. in the interview when we talked about the cyclical, uh, you know, recovery and uh, rebound. And so again, cyclical to me connotes yeah. it could be short-lived. I think the problem that we've got is, is that everything is at such hyper speed now right you know that yes this is a new secular theme the fact that interest rates will go up rather than go down my suspicion though is that it will get priced in very very quickly so tactically you know one of the 2017 trades that we have or themes that we have is called the icarus trade mm -hmm. that, that you're already eight years into this bull market. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not just beginning. You know, the valuations are not exactly, you know, super, super cheap. But this rotation that we talk about from deflation to inflation, Davos man to Joe Sixpack, it really, you could see a real capitulation into it. And, and that drives markets. They sort of melt up, yes. you know, in a, in a very sort of like certain way. And of course, ultimately, that is going to drive interest rates either to a level or up by a speed, which can either hurt the economy or actually cause a financial event. And again, I don't think that's anything to worry about in the next six to nine months, but certainly in the next six to nine quarters, it will be something to worry about. 
So we actually could see the central banks respond. I mean, the Fed has responded extremely slowly, but it is has signaled again that it's going to raise interest rates, yeah. you know, several times this year, and th this could ha happen globally. You mentioned China right. central bank already did it, yeah, and and of course that can cut off growth. Yeah, and I, I think 2017, you've still got the lingering effect of of monetary excess, monetary easing. But when you move into 2018, it's over. It's, it's gone. You know, you know, this is the year of peak central bank liquidity. And right. in 2018 really will be the first year since, I don't know, 2005, 2006, that the central bank is not your friend. Recession, bear market, are these conversations you're having with your team? In, with the for, team, for yes, not with clients. I mean, I, mean, I, I right. think right now, you know, it was early in 2017, people want, want to try and get 2017 right before they start right, worrying right. about 2018. <laughs> but I think that, that, that the more you think about 2017, you know, more bullish we, we, we generally feel. And again, as yes. I said, I think that the, the, the gains are going to be front loaded, but nonetheless, they could be quite substantial. 2018, I think, is a different story. There, you really could have the first time in many, many years where you've got higher uh, uh, interest rates taking place at a time of peak uh, positioning, but also peak macro bullishness. And I think that would make me much more bearish on the 2018 outlook. Two more questions. One is, where do I go for income, which is still scarce? Well, I think people still like REITs, and I, I, I do understand that. Um, I mean, I know that they are a yield you yeah. know, product, mm -hmm. and therefore, if interest rates go up too quickly, they can get hurt. But I do like the underlying asset itself. I mean, I think there's a lot of real estate in the world that you know has room to go higher. It may not be, you know, Manhattan. It may not be Mayfair. It may not mm -hmm. be sort of where you know the one percenters are. But I think there's a lot of real real estate around on around the planet that still has a ways to go. So we don't dislike REITs. It's it's just one of our less you know less favourite areas. But it's 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 not as bad as I think you know the credit you know, the corporate bonds will get, for example. And, and hard assets, when, when you're talking about moving from financial assets to hard assets, what kind of hard assets sh should we be owning? I mean, you just mentioned REITs, real estate. Yeah, That's real estate one, would be is, one. Is Oil, there... we think, will go to $70, you know, this year. Mm -hmm. um, I still like gold. I mean, I think that, that it doesn't work every quarter, it, it, you know, but it nonetheless, I think that if you've got higher inflation ahead of you, I think gold is an asset that will work. And of course, it encapsulates a lot of the, you know, if something goes wrong, yes. you know, gold goes right. So, you know, I think gold sort of works as well. So, you know, I think those are three sort of good areas. You know, obviously, you've got to be careful where the real estate is. But I think residential real estate, mm -hmm. I think gold, I think oil sort of makes sense. And the final question, which we always ask everyone at the end of every wealth track, is a, a one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio. What should we all own some of in a long-term diversified portfolio? I mean, my gut feel is, is, you know, China's not going away. I mean, you, you, you know, when I hear the question, it's sort of like, what don't you own that's, you know, going to remain relevant over mm -hmm. the next sort of, you know, 10 years or so? I think that the... And the way I would answer that is a very contrarian way. I mean, what do people really despise? And, you know, I think anything to do with China right now, you know, is, is the case. So I think the Chinese equity market would be mine. Michael Hartnett, always a treat to have you on WealthTrack. Thank you so much. Pleasure. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is make sure you have some inflation protection in your portfolio. With inflation making a comeback, even modestly, investments that benefit from rising prices or provide protection from them are a logical choice. We have talked about Treasury inflation protected securities, known as TIPS, many times on WealthTrack. Their rate of interest is fixed, but their principal is adjusted to inflation, so the amount of interest paid adjusts too. What we haven't discussed as much are real or hard assets, including commodities such as industrial metals, agricultural products, and fuels. There are index funds that track commodities, but we couldn't find one that was large and diversified enough to suit our tastes. So we found one of Morningstar's favorite ETFs that invests in a broad selection of natural resource companies. It is the Spider S&P Global Natural Resources ETF. Its symbol is GNR. 
It invests in the world's 90 largest stocks in the energy, agricultural, and metals and mining sectors, and makes equal weightings in each, thus avoiding the heavy energy positions found in many other natural resource funds. Commodities are extremely volatile and speculative, but a small exposure to them certainly adds inflation-sensitive diversification to a portfolio. Well, next week in another WealthTrack exclusive, we will talk to a great small cap investor, Charlie Dreyfus, founding portfolio manager of the Royce Special Equity Fund, about the rebound in small cap stocks and the treasures he is still finding among them. In this week's extra feature on our website, Michael Hartnett discusses more of the dramatic changes affecting global markets and economies. And for those of you connecting with us on Facebook and Twitter, keep the messages coming. Thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Fairholme Foundation.